I do like my Helgen diesel fleet, and I've a fair few of them. But I must admit that there's a serious design fault in the drive mechanism. Let me show you the fault and, more importantly, how to fix it. Hi, welcome back to Chadwick Model Railway. I'm Charlie. And this is the first of two videos where we take apart our locomotives and sort of fix stuff that's inside that's not quite performing or supplied as we would wish. In the second video, I'll be dismantling my Hornby King class, King George V, um, carrying out a minor repair where the bell fell off. It didn't fall off really, it just wasn't on straight in the first place and when I tried to straighten it off, it broke off. Marvellous. Um, and take apart the tender, get a sound chip in there and sort it all out. And I've also got a choice of speakers supplied by Richard from Road and Rails. So we'll install those speakers and see which ones are better. And also the same with a TMC supplied and deluxe weathered warship with which one of the lights, the internal lights doesn't work. Um, and also the roof vents haven't been fitted and it's been professionally weathered. So how, <laughs> what am I going to do there then? Can't just glue them on, it'll look a bit strange. Anyway, that's in the next video. But in this one, it's all to do with Helgens. Now, my Helgen fleet is reasonably substantial. I like their locomotives. I find them to be very reliable and they've got a bit of power in them, which I kind of like. But along with um, a DP2 that I bought um, from a subscriber, because he'd dropped it and the drive shaft has fallen out, let's say. And one of my Hymex, which one bogey doesn't, is no longer powered. I also have Falcon, which has undergone some issues. Excuse me. It's fitted, not that it has anything to do with this, it's fitted with a Zimo sound chip. And the speed, the top speed of it was far too fast for my layout. It would flow it, throw itself off the helix given half the chance. So I was up at the layout doing some CV tweaking to bring down the maximum speed and it was sort of shooting off and I was sort of dragging it back and so on. And then suddenly the drive went on it and I thought, oh dear, what have I done to one of my favourite, really favourite locos? Because I like Falcon. I remember as a child standing on Swindon Station and Falcon would come through pulling 13 Mark I coaches, whacking its way from Paddington to Bristol. Um, it was just a damn good locomotive and shame on you brush for writing into its contract that at the end of its life it should be it must be scrapped. We could easily see that roaming around the West Country, you know, Buckfastly or um, over at Bishop's Lydiard pulling trains. It would be lovely, but wasn't to be. Anyway, enough of the nostalgia. Let's look at what went wrong with my Falcon. So, have a look at this clip. So what exactly is the problem? Well, if we turn it on to say speed set 30 and give it a nudge, but I stop it and now hopefully you can hear the motor's spooling up but nothing's getting through to the drive shafts. Why? Because obviously the drive chain's incomplete. So let's take it apart and have a look what's wrong. On this, a well-known Helgen diesel issue. So now you can see what the problem is, but how has the problem come to light? Well, the problem has come to light because this motor had probably failed driving one of these bogies some months ago. And until it failed to drive the other one, it wasn't really that noticeable. Um, I mean, the power is still there. It's still a powerful engine. It's still putting, you know, it's nice and weighty. But once the other one gives up, then you realize it's um, not very good. And if you see one of these Helgen or Helian, if you're middle class, for sale on eBay, and it's described as having a poor performance, let's say, this could well be the problem, is that there's a breakdown between the motor and the bogey assembly with the drive shaft. So how do we get it all down to this sort of level? How do we take it apart? Well, I did ask a good friend of mine, Ed, to come over and have a, have a look, no, to come over and show me how to do it. You've got to admit it, really, if you don't know what you're doing. 
So first things first, get the cover off and then you can see there's the board on the inside and there's the where the 8 pin decoder plugs in. The speaker's held in with black tack and I'll leave that inside um, the body shell and I'll actually leave everything else intact along the board. As you can see here, I've previously disconnected two of the white connector blocks and that's because with running Falcon around um, with a train of coaches, I didn't want the red lights to be on. So I've be previously been in here when I fitted the decoder and I've pulled out those two blocks. The circuit board actually comes out quite easily. It's held in by uh, two rubber grips and you just push one back and then prise it off and it just comes away. Of course, you can't move it very far now because it's being held down by those small white sockets at either end with the red and black cables. And at either end, there is uh, four sockets, two of which will probably not be used because they're marked AC for an accessory that you may fit um, in the fullness of time. But there's one for the head code, one for the tail lights and the other one that runs out to, uh, to bring the power from the bogey and on top of the middle of the um, circuit board there's also one there that feeds the motor. They can be quite difficult to remove and it's always best to use a tool because you need to sort of prise back a small piece of retaining plastic um, and then you're able to pull the socket out otherwise if you pull it out too much you can pull it uh, completely away as I did previously when I removed the tail lights. The next thing we need to do is to remove the motor and that's done by just pulling up on the two rubber clamps that were holding the circuit board in place. But before we pull it all the way up it's worth marking the size of the chassis and the end of the motor so that when we come to refit it it goes back in the same way. Apparently it needs to go in the same way as you took it out. So pulling up the motor, you then the drive shafts will just pull away from either end of the motor drives. Now it would be fair to say that Ed had expected the plastic bosses on either end of the motor to be split because that's where he expected the problem to be because that's where it's been in the past. However, in this case, it was on the opposite ends. It was actually the bosses that fit on the drive shaft into the bogey assembly that were both cracked. Hopefully you can see when we zoom in a little bit, you can see where the crack has emerged. Now to remove the bogey assembly, there's a little lid that clips on or clips off and it's four little catches. Uh, it's hard to show you on the, on the video and I'll show you it later but you have to flip this little lid and it comes away relatively easily. And this allows then the bogey assembly to be pulled backwards through like a rotating um, boss, as it were. It's a circular opening with a pin on the top of which the clip went onto. All will come, all will make sense uh, in, in a few moments when I show you in close up. And there's the thing I'm talking about with the little pin on the top. So now it's time to fix it. So what I've done is I've applied IPA as isopropyl alcohol to degrease the shaft of the uh, bogies and also the inside of the little uh, drive collars, for want of a better term. So it's a case of cleaning them out, getting rid of any oil or grease and then giving time for the IPA to evaporate. And then we bring in our friend Deluxe Rocket Max glue. And if you put the Rocket Max onto polythene, a tip I learned from Laura, it doesn't dry off, you know, it doesn't dry out quickly. So a few drops into the uh, drive boss and then push the boss then onto the end of the shaft. And hopefully within a, a certain amount of time, voila, all should be well. So I just do the second one at the same time and then we'll put these aside until the morning and then sadly without Ed, it will be a case of assembling it on my own. Oh, gosh, without adult leadership. 
how will we cope? When I put the glue into this second one, I did notice some of the glue seeped out, um, but it was obviously through the crack uh, in the boss itself. So uh, I just wiped it away with my fingers, <laughs> super glue on fingers. What a great idea that was, Charlie. Anyway, no harm done. So uh, we are where we are. So leaving those overnight to dry. Now, before we go on with the reassembly, I think it's just worth pointing out some of these pieces in close up. So firstly, here's the motor and the, uh, the drive sort of boxes on the end here are identical and as are both of the drive shafts. The shafts are absolutely identical and the same length and you can't put them in the wrong way around because the, the lugs on them themselves are exactly the same. They're just mounted 45 degrees out, sorry, 90 degrees out. And they locate in the end of the drive shaft. Quite straightforward really, isn't it? And there is quite a little bit, quite a lot of slack here because as we refit this into the loco, the shaft will have to move down from an angle uh, to a more of a horizontal posture. There is the bogey assembly and there's the piece that we super glued back in. And this one here just simply has a push fit and it, you can see that it actually fits in there quite snugly. And if I turn it, then obviously this bogey should start to turn and, the, and I can see the wheels turning um, and obviously, hope, well obviously, but hopefully the super glue is going to hold when we put it all back together. But this is the item that was slipping on the shaft beneath it because of the crack. So I pull that back out and obviously the other one is absolutely identical. I mentioned about a clip that was hard to show you when I removed it and this is the little beastie here and this clips over the top of this unit here on these two lugs. If you can see there's a, a lug there and a lug there. So when, you, when this is in place you then have to simply prise it off. And there's the hole there. This is the, the beastie bit. And it's that hole that goes over the top of this alignment boss here. That hopefully you can see. Um, and this rotates back and forward, but it will also go in and out because there's the, uh, the end of the shaft just here. So try to keep it upright should you do this. Um, and if, if I can give you a tip is use the, a plain blanket as I've done here. I like this blanket. If I do any painting or whatever, I use the other side, but I try to keep it clear because when you drop nuts and bolts, they don't bounce everywhere. It's far more um, easier to find, find stuff and you don't break it. You don't scratch the paintwork or whatever. Um, so that's the, the guts of it really. Um, the only thing I haven't stripped down anymore, because this is, you know, there's not much left of this locomotive bar taking the LEDs out, well, there's no point in doing that. And then and the, the only final piece really is these bogey assemblies, which it would be silly if I didn't strip it down any, any further. So we will we'll take this apart now so you can see how this, how this is made up and how it works. So all you do to get them apart on these Hellions or Helgens is these side plates just pull off and if you do one at a time then you're not going to get them the wrong way around when you start mixing them up with the other bogey and there you can see now the the pickups running down the sides and if you want to get it apart then you have to lever off these catches here and if you lever off these two then this and the other two on the other side then this plate will lift away. But before we go any further with the prizing, it's best to get the pickups out of the way first. And these are just simply lift off like that. And nothing really could be much simpler. Pull those out of the way. And then it's prize the plate off time. As I said, there are lugs to to be prized away and off comes the plate and hopefully that all makes sense. 
with the wheels removed, now's a good time to make sure that these are absolutely perfectly clean and there's no muck on the back of the wheels um, which the uh, pick which will end up on the pickups. So this is a great time for a little bit of husbandry to make sure everything's good and then it's of course a time to clean up um, any muck that's inside uh, with the gears, remove with the old grease and um, yeah, re-lubricate as necessary and then obviously pop the lid back on. And here you can see now there are four um, lugs that hold this in place on each side. So it's a bit fiddly to get off. Um, I've actually removed one in, in situ with the wheels all assembled in the loco. Um, it can be a little bit tricky. The worst thing about when I did it then is I actually didn't know um, which, how, how to get that off. And it was just a bit of sort of trial and error really, which um, wasn't the best idea I've ever had. Now having reassembled them, I was just in for a shock really, because suddenly, whilst they seem straightforward, but the red cable and the black cable are on the same side. But I've just been back to the previous footage and this is exactly how they are when Helgen built them. I thought for a moment that I'd somehow reversed um, the, the brass pickups, but, um, but I haven't. That's the way they are, and it's obviously sorted out when they plug into the board. I mean, I would have thought that a red would have come from the same side and a black from the same side, because this is obviously the end where the coupling goes and there are the drive shafts, but it isn't. And when you're reassembling Helgens, don't forget um, to uh, do one at a time and make sure you've got the steps at the right end, because obviously the steps will lead up to the cab. But um, yeah, not quite obvious, but noteworthy, let's say. Now before I start the reassembly, I have um, in my possession a DP2, which I uh, bought from a subscriber. But he tells me that it has a drive shaft missing. So before I um, reassemble this one, I just want to measure these drive shafts because in the DP2 literature, it doesn't give a part number for, the D for that drive shaft. Right, this one is 52, it comes up at 52.14 mil. So I used to say it's, yeah, 52. So these are 52 millimeters long. So um, I now know that if the DP2 is 52 millimeters long as well, then these will obviously fit into that loco. Right, have a quick chat about oils and greases before we put it back together. Um, here's a little, uh, grease that uh, a friend of mine has recommended, good old Ian, and this is the oil that I use. I've no idea what make this is. Um, I've had it for years, um, but it's a, it's a little um, needle type applicator, and all I do with these is I pop a little bit in this worm gear on the top of here, and also on the other bogey, and uh, I don't do a lot of oiling, I must confess. I think it uh, attracts dirt and it's not necessarily a good thing to do. Now, if we look into this loco boss here, now hopefully I'll zoom you in nice and close with a bit of luck. And hopefully you can see this round unit here. Yep, this round unit here. Now I mentioned before, try to keep it in place and try and let it fall out, it's a bit of a so-and-so, but I noticed that there's a longer pin on the top than on the bottom. So if you're taking one of these Helgen type locos, be advised that this might be used on two locos, one of which requires a longer pin than the other. Um, so to save money, Helgen just make one that's adaptable for both. Um, this has got a bit of manky old grease in it and all I use is, a, is, is I, I grip the sides so this thing doesn't go anywhere and then I just run a cotton bud through, whip out any old grease there and hopefully you can see there's the yellow manky old grease. So all I should do is with my grease here is pop some on a cocktail stick and just give it a little dab. Now clearly, if you put too much on, it's no big deal because you can just use a cotton bud to take it off. But all I'm doing is put a little bit of grease around the inside face of this bearing here. 
and on the top where the pivot goes. And really not, not too much at all. Too much grease will invariably, invariably cause problems. And that's really all I'm going to put on. Now, what I said earlier about this rotating unit here was absolutely wrong um, because this top pin is for, is for the, to locate with this clip, but the bottom pin actually locates within a very small hole. This is a little boss there um, beneath the uh, drive shaft. There's a small hole, so obviously we need to feed it into the small hole first and then um, the, the unit, the round unit, will then form over the top of the drive shaft and then we put the clip over the top of that. Hopefully we can do this in close-up so you can see a little better. Right. Now we offer the bogey over the top, pull the cables through so they're not snagged. And then we need to rotate the opening ready to receive the shaft. Now, the pure physics of it, it isn't the right size and what's going to happen is this casing will open and allow the shaft to move out of its seating inside to allow it to go through the hole and that's just the way it is. So that goes through there and then hopefully the bottom pin is locating in there, which it is. So that was a little simpler than I thought it would be. Let me just check those cables are free, which they are. So now we just need to pop this over the top and clip it into place. Hey, there we go. All straightforward. One down, one to go. So here we go. Number two, pop it back over the top. Bring the cables out of the way, sort of pop it in position, allow the casing to open, a little bit of fiddling. Not quite easy this one. Waiting for that casing to open. And then hopefully we should be back in position. No, we're not. We've gone in too far. The, this is too far. It's the other side of the boss. So we need to pull it back out a bit. And are we in now? Not quite. That felt better. Yep, I think we're in. No, we're not. we are this time. Back to the clip again, 
over the top of the stud and then press it down. Okay, never as easy as you think, is it? The first one went on quite easy, the second one was a little more difficult, but hey, got there in the end. And none of this is really uh, vulnerable to breakage. It all seems to sort of go okay, really. It's, you know, it's not the sort of thing that um, snaps off like the odd set of steps or whatever. So there we go, both ends done. Now it's time to refit the motor. There's a little cross, if you remember, that Ed put on the chassis and also on the side of the motor so we knew which side was which. And then there are these two rubber packing pieces which form around the motor. And then we need to slide this into position, making sure that the cables are free. And that sort of sits in here and pushes down. But we have, of course, got two drive shafts to fit. Now, the way I think it works is if you poke the drive shaft in in first into the lower into the the wheel mechanism sorry the the bogey mechanism <laughs> and then that should oh there we go that that's clipped into place and then we need to offer it into the motor i'm worried about this cable now how does this cable go yeah that'll be right yeah so then we need to offer it into the motor and then we do the same for the other end so we poke that one in there into the into the drive boss that we just put in yep that's in there and then offer this one up into the motor now I've got them both horizontally, so hopefully now as I push the motor down, the drive shafts should go into these, into the, 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 the bosses here, and that will take up the slack. So just check that this is all alright. It's all free, yep, yeah. we seem to be doing okay. Push it a little more. Yep, so push it right down and we should be in position. And then if I spin the drive shaft, both shafts are turning. And I'm just checking that all the wheels are turning as well. Yes, they are. Okay, hopefully that's all well and seated in there. Right, now the circuit board. Now knowing that my Falcon has drivers at one end and it's the end away from the KD coupling, I can't really put this on the wrong way around now. So. This is a case of just popping the circuit board lo loosely in position and making sure that the, the feed cables for the um, circuit board are free and away from the flywheels. And they seem to want to come through that little gap there. So pop those in position there. And then it's just a case of feeding the circuit board um, into the little rubber grommets poke that cable out of the way and these little rubber well not grommets are they sort of rubber clips and they hold the circuit board in place like so and then it's a case of making sure you've got the alignment right because they drop down a little bit um, where these the ends are slightly uh, sort of larger let's say so that's that back in place now we need to start plugging back in so we shall start with the uh, power for the motor. I think we'll have these cables above there. So there's the motor cable coming in. Let's get those out of the way. 
So the motor cable plugs in there. And then starting at one end, we've got the red, which is the, um, the rear lights. And I, before I had, I disconnected the reds at the tail end. So we will leave those disconnected, but I will put the reds back in on this end in case I want to run her the other way around. So the reds must be the lower light. So the LED is this one, the lower one. So that must be that one there. So you must be the reds. Which way do these go in? I think it's that way. Yep. Yeah. So there's that red. Next comes the white, which is the head code. Where are you? You're there. Pop that in there. In goes the head code. Should put it in the right way up. The head code. Next into, into it goes the pickups from the bogies and AC with the accessories was empty. So we just need to poke these down out of the way like that. Make sure they're clear of the bogey area and we're good to go. And the same on the other end. Except, I'm sorry, I'm not, not quite the same. I'm not going to fit the, uh, the red tail lights on this one here. So the red tail lights must be the low one. So that must be the red. So we'll leave that one off. There's the whites. So then we have the motor. Sorry, not the motor, the pickups. Pickups. And this, as I said, is the red, which we're going to leave off. And we should hopefully be good to go. Gosh, so worry this, isn't it? Right, I need to get some, a couple of bits of tape, just to tape across here to make sure these cables all stay in the right place. So there we have it, a little bit of tape to keep the cables out of harm's way. And then hopefully we can just refit this. This should clip into position. And we can then take it back onto the layout. Have we just wasted <laughs> A couple of days of my life or will it work perfectly who knows so here we are back on the tracks and if i power up the layout and then we dial into loco 1200 and i turn on the lights oh we have a head code and no red lights which is correct turn it the other way and as you can see in the mirror, you've got the head code and we have the red lights. So now we need to reposition this. Oh, this that head code's bright, obviously needs turning down. So now we need to test the, um, the drive shafts. Right, let's reposition this camera and give it a go. So now we just need to carry out our simple speed test again. So if I get Falcon to run up, And she's off like a shot. And of course we do need to check, of course, that both sets of wheels are in fact turning. And as you can see, by holding the loco back, you can see the wheels slipping. So we know we've got dry to all axles now, obviously not the centre ones, they're not driven, and the loco works perfectly. 
So that's Falcon fixed, hopefully with our fingers crossed. It probably needs a little bit of running in, so I'll give it a little time before we start to put her back on duty under load. So what's next? Well, Heimek 7007 springs to mind. And as you can see here, the bogeys on the right hand side turn and the ones on the left don't and it makes a funny noise. It's going to be the same sort of thing, another drive train issue kind of thing. Um, it could be the other end of the, uh, the drive, you know, the motor end and there's those two um, black uh, rubber, uh, rubber plastic um, sort of collars on the end of the drive motor which Ed mentions it could just as easily be those, or in some cases, normally those. It was uh, perhaps an exception, Falcon being on the other end. But hopefully from this video, if you've got a Helgen issue, let's say, you can sort it out. Of course, the best thing to do now is to get your Helgen logos, pop them on the tracks and box them in, and then just turn on a little bit of power and see if all the driven axles turn. Because if they all do, then apparently you haven't got an issue and away you go. But of course, if some of them don't turn, then you obviously you're dragging it around on one axle um, and it might be time to fix it. Send it in for repair, sell it on eBay, but declare the defect, obviously, um, and take it from there. You know, if it's a 1968, 70s Western kind of thing, I might even be interested myself if I want to take it apart. But I'll leave that with you. But it is a serious issue and you do need to sort them out. And now it will soon be time for me to start on my next set of locomotive repairs. How exciting. In the meantime, of course, I do thank the patrons and of course the people who subscribe. If you'd like to become a patron, there should be a button there. Similarly, if you haven't subscribed the button there and a video here and here. Take care, guys, and I'll see you at the next one. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.